where I left off, I didn't show you this slide, but this is the next slide that we want to talk about today in the chapter on stress. Uh, I'd like to do that progressive mental relaxation with you, uh, and I'll do that probably later on, maybe around 9.30 or 9.40, when I know everybody's here and they're not going to interrupt us. This is a very interesting study done by a fellow by the name of Martin Seligman, okay? It's called Learn Helplessness. This has a lot to do with conditioning, and so, but they put it in this chapter when they talk about helplessness and also depression. Those of you who like dogs and uh, are going to like this study because of what they did with the dogs, uh, but it's an interesting study that's done, and I'll show you how he tried to help the dogs as well. He used a form of classical condition. He didn't want to hurt the dogs all the time, although I do know a side part of this study. He, he didn't always do classical conditioning with them. What he did is that he had a dog here, okay, in, in A. And this, this representation isn't that good. I was online this morning trying to find something else, and I couldn't find anything. But what you have is a nice little doggy that's there, okay? And, and what happens is that there's a barrier that's here. So here's the barrier, and sometimes they put food over here, and then the dog uh, looks at the food, he jumps over the barrier, eats it, they put him back there. Then what they do is that they're, they're flashing a light. Every time the light goes on, they're trying to train the dog to go over the barrier. Well, they take the next step, and what they do in this one is they shock the dog. All right, so the dog is sitting there, and they shock the dog, turn on the light. Shock the dog, turn on the light. Shock the dog, turn on the light. What's that sound like? Classical conditions, right? Remember that? All right, so they condition the dog, so every time the light comes on, he thinks he's going to get shocked, and then he jumps over. But by the way, Seligman's first study, he didn't just do the light. He just shocked the dog, <laughs> and then went over and went over and over. Then he started thinking, or one of his graduate assistants said, oh, this is <laughs> hurting these dogs. So he said, all right, let's classically contrain them. We won't hurt them anymore, except from the beginning. So he, light comes on and goes over. Right, so then what they did, they did, it, did this in a couple of different ways. One, they put a harness on the dog, okay? And this, they didn't show this here, but there's, supposedly there's gonna be a harness on this dog. The light goes off or they shock him, and the dog tries to get out, but he can't do it. Daddy can't do it. Another part of the experiment is that they didn't put a harness on him, but they put the barrier so high that the dog couldn't get out. So either the dog thought he was going to get shocked, or he did get shocked, depending upon the, the experiment. So what happens is the poor dog is sitting there, the light goes off, the shock comes on, but he can't get out. And he sits there. And, he, and at first, he's banging against it, can't get out, bangs against it, and eventually he just kind of sits there. And then as he sits there, the light comes on, and he whelps a little bit, and he shock comes on, or, or the light comes on again, doesn't do anything, doesn't do anything. Finally, the light keeps coming on, and the dog doesn't do anything, he just lays there. Okay? Then what they did, and this is not this part here, then they went ahead and took the barrier down, or took the harness on, turned on the light, and the dog didn't move either. The dog just stayed there, just stayed there and stayed there, stayed, even without the barrier. He just stayed there and stayed there and stayed there. What Seligman concluded was that it looks like I've trained the dog, okay, to learn to become helpless. And the key word to this is that he, the dog has no control whatsoever that's going on. No matter what he does, jump against it, yell, bark, he can't get out. So when we look, and I'm going to come back to D in a, in a second, but when we look at this, learn helplessness, he says, is a learned inability to overcome obstacles or avoid punishment. Now, those of you who can think critically, right, which you all can, I want you to think a little bit about, you're not a dog, and humans obviously not dogs, but are there situations in people's lives where learned helplessness could explain why they have certain issues or problems that, that are there. So a learned inability to overcome obstacles or avoid punishment. It's learned passivity and an inaction to aversive stimuli. So things are bad, things are bad, things are bad, things are bad. No matter what I do, I can't get out of this. The situation is uncontrollable. What 
Seligman noticed with the dogs that the dogs learned to be helpless. He trained the dogs or conditioned the dog to be helpless. They just can't move. What he then found is that that helplessness then turns to hopelessness. Okay? Hopelessness. No matter what I do, I can't get out. Seligman then said, well, I wonder if this happens with humans. And one of the first places he went to were nursing homes, okay? trying to determine what went on in nursing homes. Now, and I don't mean retired communities or assisted living. I'm, I'm talking the last step that's there, a true nursing home where you can't take care of yourself 100%. So you have to, you wear a diaper, you're being fed, you can't do much of anything. And he looked at that and said, my gosh, you know, they can't control anything in their life. They're kind of like the, the dogs in that sense. And then he wanted to see, well, what, what, just what is the life expectancy of people who go into nursing homes? Now, obviously, you go in at that stage, you have some severe physical issues uh, that are there. And what he found is the rate of death in those nursing homes is much higher okay, than in uh, other assisted living homes or even if people were kept in their homes. Okay? What seems to happen is that that helplessness leads to hopelessness, hopelessness and then people begin to give up. How else do we see this? Well. I know I'm getting a little political right now, and we can get in that direction. I don't want to do that. But, you know, if you're in a situation and you come from a poverty-ridden neighborhood where there's not much going on there, all your mentors and your modeling indicate that, you know, there's really not much hope for you. You'll never get out of this. You go to your school, and your school tells you the same thing. You know, you're pretty, pretty dumb. I don't think you'll be able to ever get out of this uh, whatsoever. Your church group isn't there either uh, for you. Okay? Everybody around you is either getting arrested and thrown into prison. Okay? After a while, but, but you're trying. You, know, you try to get out. You try to go to school. You try to do this. You try to get that, do that. But every time you try, you get knocked down, knocked down, knocked down again. Well, that could be a learned helplessness that's there. Okay? A learned helplessness there, that you can't get out of those situations. You just feel very, very stuck. I mean, I've seen that happen to numerous people. Every time they try to get ahead and get motivated to do something, they get knocked back again. What we're looking at here is something called attributions, okay? where you begin to attribute what's going on in your life probably to yourself. Okay? I can't do this. What's wrong with me? Let's put this not on such a tragic level, but let's just say you go to your first math class and you, you fail the first test, the second test, and the third test. Okay? And, but you're really studying hard. I mean, you really are, but you just can't do it. Well, after a while, you may develop and you may attribute okay, your inability to, or your, your failing of tests to your lack of math skills. And what winds up happening, you throw up your hands and you say, I'll never pass math. And if I can't pass developmental 090, then how am I ever going to pass college algebra? I'll never get a college degree to hell with college. Then what happens sometimes, you're down and you're upset about that math score, and then you come to psychology, and I'm going through these little quick clicker questions that's there, and you're getting too wrong, and all of a sudden you begin to generalize that attribution that I can't do math very well. But look, I'm getting these silly quack clicker questions wrong. 82% of the people got that one right. I got it wrong. There must be something wrong with me. I'm dumb. That's what I am. I can't go to school. And before you know, that becomes generalized and you learn to become kind of helpless about things or hopeless about going to school. And how quickly can that stuff start happening? because it's the way you begin to think about things. Now, I'm also going to say, isn't that what suicidal ideation is all about? Okay, those of you who've had suicidal ideation, you thought about that, you come to the end of your line, I don't think, I, no matter what I do, it doesn't work. Okay, therefore you begin, like, just like the dog, you keep banging your head, you're trying to get out, nothing happens, so you lay down and give up. Okay? It's an uncontrollable situation. I can't do anything. Suicidal ideation or suicide or even depression. Let me just go back 
for a second, and I'm going to talk more about depression. This part here, what he began to do is, I mean, he wasn't really a mean guy. Matter of fact, Martin Seligman is, is really the, the one who's written so much about positive psychology. If you ever go on his site, he has a book called Learned Optimism. So what he did was take this information and say, well, if we can train people to be, what, negative, okay, and helpless, why can't we train them to be more optimistic and positive about things? So what he then did was develop something called, I call it resiliency training. Uh, your book calls it mastery training, okay, to develop hope. They went back to those dogs, okay, took the barrier down. The graduate assistants would go in, and it's another form of conditioning, okay, but this time's a little more uh, positive, okay. The light would come on, they grab the dog and hold the dog and hold the dog, mm, love the dog, pick the dog up, put him over on the other side. And they did it again and again and again and again and again to slowly then train the dog, okay, then to say, there is a way out. I believe in you. Um, I'm giving this a little more of a human quality to it, okay? But I believe in you. It's okay. It's okay to be helped. We can do this. And they did it over and over and over again until the dog, okay, they did put the barrier up. The light went on, and what you saw there, the dog jumped out. What was interesting about this, too, I thought, and I also thought good, was that once the dogs began to get some energy, like I don't have to just lay there anymore, okay, they're beginning to move around, one of the first things they did was growl and bite the, the trainers who were trying to get them out, as if they were saying, and I'm making this up, as if they're saying, Jim, now you're doing this? <laughs> what about before? That really pisses me off. <laughs> okay, like that. But also what you need to recognize, sometimes when people come out of depression, sometimes what they do is they get angry first. And what anger is, it's an emotion okay, that energizes people. So I'm so mad. You're so mad you're going to do what? Ah, I'm so mad I'm going to. Well, do something. <laughs> We're just laying there. Okay? And energy, that's what? Constructive anger that, that, that's there. All right? You've gone through a divorce. You're upset. You, you lost your job. Things are crap. Nothing's going right in my life. That really pisses me off. Well, good. <laughs> what do you want to do with that energy instead of turning it inward? Because if you ever heard the term anger turned inward turns to depression? Okay, so if one can get that out, okay, then that can be energizing. And that happened with the dogs uh, as well. Does this happen with uh, humans? Sure they do. What about people who are, have some type of, uh, who've been traumatized, okay, who are in uh, incredible situations, they couldn't get out, abuse, sex abuse as a child, they're overwhelmed, uncontrollable uh, situations that's there. Can they recover and train from that? Sure. What do they do? They go resiliency training that's there. One person to believe in you, show you that there's a chance that's there. Maybe a really good math teacher who says, you know what, you're not dumb. It's just you probably haven't had the high school or elementary school education to help you with this. Don't get so frustrated. Come on, let's do this again. And they work with you, work with you, see what I'm doing, little steps at a time, and then you finally passed math 090, okay? And you made your way, and now you're a PhD in math. No, I don't think you go that far, but, but what happens is that people taking time and saying to people step by step, it's okay. It's the attributions in terms of the way you think about yourself that get people down, that overwhelm them. The dog saying, no matter what I do, I can't get out, or you saying, no matter what I do, I can't get out. So what does that lead to? That leads to depression. A fellow by the name of Beck, B-E-C-K, has written a lot about the depression. And he says, here are the five warning signs. Uh, by the way, those of you who printed out uh, some of those uh, outlines, I don't know if I have all of this in there. I've just kind of recently added this stuff, like yesterday. <laughs> so. So this may be a little new for you. I, I was just thinking, I, I, I should talk about depression. I was going to talk about it later on, but this is a good time to talk about it. Uh, it's basically indicated that anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of the general population will be dealing with depression sometime in their life. So let me at least talk about it. Recognizing depression, because sometimes people don't even recognize they're depressed. 
All right? You have constantly negative opinion of yourself. I can't, I can't, 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 what's wrong with me? I can't do this. All right? Constant, nobody likes me. You engage in frequent self-criticism and self-blame. I know every once in a while we say, oh, God, why did I do that? That's so dumb of me to do that. But that slackens off and you're still more positive. But people who are depressed, it's a lot about how they think. And there's a lot of self-criticism and self-blame. You place negative interpretations or events that usually won't bother you. For most people, you know, it gets so bad that for most people, something happens like whatever. But for someone who's depressed, they begin to elaborate on this stuff. Even the slightest thing, like you're late two minutes for class, all of a sudden it's what's wrong with me. Okay? Why? I was walking behind this person, they were so slow. Why were they doing that to me? Everything seems to happen to me. That's called personalization. When people get depressed, they also begin to personalize. Everything is being done to them. And then they say, well, I guess it's because I see that I can't even choose people to walk behind. That doesn't even make sense, does it? You're choosing people to walk behind. But you get so depressed sometimes that your thoughts get so negative, you even blame yourself for walking behind someone who's slow. That's silly, right? Or you go to the grocery line, you're trying to see which one is, is quicker, and you go, oh, I always choose the slow one. What's wrong with me? I mean, that's, you know, you're so negative. The future looks bleak and negative. You feel that your responsibilities are overwhelming. You just don't have any more energy, and all of your energy gets turned inward against you. Very, very negative. That's there. All right? Learned helplessness. I mean, that's a big part of this. It's learned helplessness. And by the way, you didn't... You know, at the beginning of the semester, we talked about some people have chemical depressions, right? This is different, okay? This isn't... Some people have chemical depressions. They start off that way, and then their thinking goes this way. Other people get into situations in their life where they try to succeed and things hamper them and they interpret it then as there must be something wrong with me. That's there. Chemical depressions are there. Then sometimes because you don't feel very well, then your thinking gets negative and then sometimes you even create situations where you're not going to succeed it. Resiliency training or interdepression training also talks about trying to gain small successes at a time. And Beck's work says, change the way you think. Yeah, I'm walking behind someone who's slow, but you know what? That happens. That just happens sometimes. Oh, silly me. Those things just happen. My son, when he was younger, every time he made a mistake, I thought it was kind of cool. He would just say, oh, silly me. I made that was kind of silly, Dad. I said, yeah, well, yeah, dude, right now, okay. And God, I said, everything just rolls off of him. He doesn't do that anymore. But, but at that time in his life, I thought, well, that's a pretty healthy attitude, isn't it? Now, did that, but, it, you know, but if he did that each and every time and he never became, what, responsible for his actions, then that wasn't very good. But he wasn't. He just didn't let stuff get to him. People who are depressed let things get to them. Some of it is because of neurochemical interactions, right? And what happens is that their neurochemicals are off, which forces you to contemplate and worry and think about things. Other people, it's life situations. Some of you, it's what happened when you were growing up. Remember that? Life scripts, what you were taught, you can't do anything. What's wrong with you? God, you're, God, you're such a pain. <laughs> It is trouble. <laughs> what a burden you are in my life. And if you hear that over and over again, then that's what's going to be your attribution, the way you think about yourself. Stop it! <laughs> right? Isn't that what you need to do in your brain when that happens? It's like, stop it! It wasn't about me. I was just told that. I had crazy parents. What can I do? Okay? I got unlucky. I was born. I'm just really speaking loud. Right? I got unlucky. I was born to two unhealthy parents. I was unlucky. It wasn't about me, my essence, who I am. I just got unlucky. And what I need to do now is slowly begin to, like Seligman's dogs, just get out of the situation. See if I can get one small success that, that's here. One small success, another small success, another small success. Yeah, Steve, I'm going to do, I'm going to be successful. I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to get a PhD, and then I'll be successful. Successful. Well, great, but let's not get a PhD just yet. 
because if you're thinking about doing that and you didn't get it in three years, it takes about seven to nine years, then you're going to be upset with yourself. So let's just say, let's do this semester. Let's get, let's get past this one test and then feel good about doing that, right? To start to reverse those old attributions that you have. All right, I'm talking to people who have a tendency to be depressed and you need to think about this. By the way, easier said than done. All right, if you've had years worth of this type of thinking, easier said than done, but if you can make small steps, then again, slow, slow steps will begin to change this. And then your attributions won't be so generalized. All right, I got off into that, but I think that's important. Learn for one point, learn helplessness tends to occur when events appear to be what? Frustrating, in conflict, uncontrollable, or problem focused. Do you, do you, uh, I'm gonna, I'll, I was going to say, do you understand the key word for this? But that, that'll be the answer. So, Everybody got this one? No. Oh, okay. All right, now he's got it. 92% of you were correct. All right, uncontrollable. See, you listen to somebody, so, you know, all right. Uncontrollable. That's the key word that's here. Because we get, learn helplessness, we get stuck. It's depression, it's suicidal ideation. So if there's one thought you can put in the back of your brain is, I know it's really bad, but hang in there. Hang in there. You know, the proverbial, there's light at the end of the tunnel. I don't think it's a train coming, okay? There's light at the end of the tunnel. Just take one small step. One of the best ways to get out of depression is make a list and do things and go start doing things. Because what winds up happening, you have no energy and you just kind of lay there. And when you lay there, your brain goes, oh, I guess we're just laying here thinking about things. And what do you think about is negative things. You've got to get yourself out and moving. That's why they give you an antidepressant, which is also called a mood elevator to give you more energy to go do things. The worst thing you do is just sit there. Now let's talk about those of you who are stressed. <laughs> the rest of this will be a few people who are stressed. Let's figure out how stressed you really are. Because a lot of times we don't even recognize how stressed we are. This is a little survey that's called the Life Event Survey. It's uh, change increases stress. What they're saying here is that when you go through change in your life, what happens is your stress levels go up, whether that change is negative or positive. Do you hear what I said? You're getting married. Great. It's stressful. You're getting a divorce. For some people, great. Well, it's stressful. For other people, no. Okay? But it's stressful. Anytime you have change, you came to school this semester. Stressful. No, I wouldn't equate that to getting married, but it's still stressful. Anytime you have changes in your life, it becomes stressful. Uh, there are two researchers that came up with what they called was the social readjustment rate, or rating scale. What they said was that if you experience, I'm going to show you these events, that some events are more powerful than others, and if you would, as I show these to you, write down how many points you may have accumulated doing this, I can show you whether or not you may have health issues in the next year or so. Because that's what this research is about. I don't know if you want to know this. Think about in the last year, don't read the top of that, but think about in the last year. By the way, this is in your course document section. I put it in there as well. There's another one in your textbook that's just directed to college students and what they go through. This is the one for the general adult population. If you've had a death of a spouse in the last year, you need to say that's 100 points, right? So what you might want to do is on a piece of paper or on your phones, add up how many points you may have accumulated on this stuff. So go down this list. Did you get married this year? Well, that's worth 50 points. Uh, did you retire? That's 45 points. Have you had sexual dif difficulties? That's 39 points. Now, if you've had sexual difficulties every night for a year, don't multiply that by 365, right? Just do once, 39. I mean, your number's going to be too high. 
So did you do that page? Got it? I mean, you can do this or not do this, whatever you want to do, but I think it's interesting when we come to the conclusions. Because what they're going to do, what Holmes and Ray, who did this survey, then this is done with tens of thousands of people, then correlated what happened to them in the year after taking this survey to see if this stress had any effect on them. This is another one that you can look at. You know, a lot of these just don't have anything to do with a lot of them, right? I don't think you've bought a house in the last year or got foreclosed on and stuff. But by the way, if you are in a home that got foreclosed on, like for your parents' home or something, then you probably need to say that affected you. So you need to check that off. Did you experience any of this stuff? Now, 27, you all have, right? Begin or end schooling, so you, get, you all have at least 26 points. All right, you got that one? No, that's it. Okay. Okay, and this is the last one. And by the way, this is a shortened version of this. I can show you a longer one. Okay. So some of you may come up with 800 points. Or you've had a lot of stuff going on in your life. Now, where it says Christmas, okay, you can put a slash by that. Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Ramadan. I mean, anything that you can think of that's a holiday you can put in there that you've experienced. It's kind of odd to say that, right? Because most holidays are fun, okay, that, that you've gone through, but they're stressful. You'll hear parents say that, oh, good, glad this is over. Today's the first day of the holiday season, isn't it? Halloween. My children used to say, oh, the holiday season is beginning. I never knew Halloween was that big, but I guess the last couple of years it is. No one has a costume on. All right. Oh, you do have costumes on, huh? You dress like college students. All right, so add up all your points. What'd you come up with? What'd you come up with? And then tell me what you came up with. And then I'll, I'll show you what the research says this might happen to you in the next year. Okay, everybody got that? Now, as, as they add this up, stuff up, let me say that I'm going to show you this survey, but anything that has to do with human behavior, remember, it's, nothing is ever 100% accurate. Okay, what this is is a correlational study uh, that, that's there, so it's not as accurate. So if you have 800 points and I say you'll probably die in the next year, uh, I don't think that's true, right? Don't take that as a suggestion. It's just that you've had a lot of stress. And I'll tell you some stories about some people as well. All right, so we're all over the place. 12% of you score pretty high. That's there. 13% add very little go on in your life. But let me give you the research on this. Uh, they did, didn't, I told you, a correlational study. They said basically people who score from 0 to 150 really didn't have any significant illnesses, accidents, or any personal, psychological, emotional issues in the following year. Now, I'm saying the following year. Later on, we're going to talk about Seligman's general adaptation syndrome. And what he says, when stress hits us, okay, usually our bodies gear up and resist it because we're trying to survive. It's afterwards, when we hit exhaustion, that this stuff may hit you. 150 to 199, these people, 33% of them did have a illness, okay, or an accident in the next year. Now, but most of it was mild life types of issues from a psychological point, okay? Uh, they had some disruptions in, in their relationship. 
they had some minor depression, some minor anxiety that's there, okay? They may have gotten sick and got the flu for the first time in a, in a couple of years, that's there. But all it was kind of mild, that's there. But recognize how the statistics go up and the percentage of people get higher. Two to 299 moderate life issues that are there, like they did have anxiety and probably could get diagnosed as having some type of anxiety or even anxiety attacks during that time. They had depression enough that, they, that people around them did notice that. Their accident rates in terms of car accidents, being tripped, falling, breaking arms went up uh, as well. Now that flu probably turned into a bronchitis, let, let's say. Okay, where they missed work for not just a few days, but probably for a week. 300 and more, 80% of these people had something happen to them. Again, accidents, the bronchitis may have turned into pneumonia and they were hospitalized for it. Two, they had major depression or not only had anxiety issues, but may have had panic attacks during that time as, as well. They had major issues. Uh, heart attack rates increased. Uh, percentage of people who came down with cancer increased once they had higher numbers like this. Now, for some of them, you're, you're going 300. <laughs> It'll have 800. <laughs> what does that mean to me? Well, it may not mean anything, okay? Because it depends how you take care of yourself. So what we're going to talk about is stress management. Remember I did this and I said that there's a line that's there. This is the stress line. If you go over this line, what happens? You're going to become debilitated. The stress is going to start to affect you, 300 and more. But I've known people who've scored six, seven, 800 on this stuff, never had an issue or problem. Why? Because they did things as their stress went up and probably went over, then they did things to bring it back down again, and they didn't live above this line. When you live above this line, it's like what? Pushing the car to the red line and keeping it there. Eventually, something's going to break down. Now, I want to caution you. I did not say that stress causes cancer or heart attacks. But we do know that stress is correlated with it because it's to what? Putting pressure okay, on the system that, that's there. So what we're going to learn is to... Right? Not live up here, but do things to keep it down here. All right? Some of us, though, what winds up happening, it's not the big things that bother us, it's the little things. Driving to school, gosh, LBJ now? <laughs> Driving along on LBJ, uh, you thought you got a 90 on the test, but you really got an 84, which sounds to me pretty good. So, but that upsets you a little bit. Um, you were going to go to this great Halloween party tonight, but your boss said, no, I need you to work, and now you can't go. Uh, you know, those little, everyday little hassles that happen, and sometimes they build up on us, and they build up on us, and boom, we're over the line again on that stuff. Need to do something to bring it back down. You've heard of stress-prone personalities, that some people, because of their personality structure, are stress prone, they bring on stress. Well, the classic experiment, not experiment, the classic research was done on what's called type A and type B people. Type A people, these are the characteristics of a type A person. So you might want to go down, look at this list, and then again figure, do I have one characteristic, two, three, four, five, or six of these? See how many characteristics you have. But a type A person is someone who pushes, 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 goes, goes, goes. You always hear them say, there's never enough time in the day to do anything. If you're going to do something right, you've got to do it yourself. You can't trust anybody else. And they're constantly going and going and going. This original research wasn't done by psychologists. This original research was really done by cardiologists. And the, did, they did this, it's kind of a funny story, but they did this because they were upset with their interior designer. Because their interior designer just sold them this commercial grade furniture for their waiting room, and they spent a lot of money on it. And after about a year, or 
a little longer than that, but I began to notice that the edge of the couches and the chairs were beginning to wear out, and they were upset with this interior design. And they said, you sold us, you know, cheap furniture. And he said, no, 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 that's really good stuff that, that you had. He says, I think it's where your people are sitting. And he said, well, why would people always sit on their edge of their chairs? So what they had their nurses do, every 15 minutes, they were to look out and map where people were sitting. Now, if you're going to a cardiologist, you've got a problem, right? You don't just walk in and say, hi, I'd like to see you. You were referred there because you have heart issues, right? You have heart problems. I hope none of you ever find this out, but once you go to a specialist, your weight, <laughs> you think you wait long for your, uh, your GP, wait till you go to a, to a cardiologist or somebody, you may be sitting there for two hours before you see them. One, because they're dealing with seriously ill people, and two, sometimes they get a call and they gotta go attend to somebody, okay, and then they come back. So what winds up happening is people who are impatient are sitting there going, and they get to what the edge of their chair. People magazine. How long are they going to get it? So what they begin to find out is a high percentage of the people, okay, who went to see cardiologists were sitting at the edge of their chairs. And when they develop a little questionnaire like this, they were the people who were like this, just go go go. So where are you? My type A score that you have zero to two characteristics of those, three to four, five to seven, or more than eight. More than eight. Now type B people, they noticed when they were sitting there, were sitting way in the back, you know, that they, they were more relaxed and they were kind of like, whatever, it's a cardiologist, we're gonna have to wait. Okay, I'll get in to see him when I see him. No big thing. So if you scored uh, about five, number three or four, 37% of you, we can probably say that you have a tendency to be a type A person, okay? Push, push, go, 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 go. More than eight, you're a type A person, period, okay? <laughs> Those of you who scored zero to two, whatever, <laughs> you're a little more laid back. Now, when psychologists got a hold of this stuff, okay, they said, well, I don't know about this. Uh, sitting on the edge of a chair and stuff like that. It seems to me that not all type A people have heart attacks, okay? that they're not that driven. And the answer is yes. The number one reason people have heart attacks is genetics, right? Two, it's diet. Three, is lack of exercise that's there. Okay? And then eventually you get the stress that's there. So the cardiologist, so the psychologist then said, I wonder if we took the type A people who are classified as type A, and then did further studies, is there any correlation with heart attacks or other illnesses? And the psychologist said, yeah, we came up with three key elements. What we found was that if these type A people were angry, now watch me, ah, I'm sitting in this office like this, I'm just wasting my time, idiot doctors. They probably, oh, why am I even sitting? He can't do anything for me anyway. That's cynical, hostile. I don't know if I can, if that stuff, what he did to me, he put that valve in me, you know, got a pig valve in me. What the hell is this pig valve stuff? Okay. They're always, they're cynical. They're not trustworthy. They're angry. They're like this all the time. And when they're like this all the time, that seems to increase what? Their stress levels. They never calm down. So we find that, is there a stress-prone personality? Yeah, is it type A, type B? Well, we don't know. But we look at these three key elements, that seems to push people to be a, uh, have more stress on their body and increase their risks. Hopefully you're not this way, are you? The positive psychology people talked about how how do some people handle stress? We're all under stress, by the way. We are all under stress. We, we talked about that the other day. Who handles stress better? One, he, Seligman and his associates said, these people are called hardy personalities. Hardy, I can, I can handle this stuff. These are people who, remember these are psychological issues, is what you think about. They're committed to something. Why am I in school? Oh, because I want to get a degree, 
I want to make more money. I'm committed to this. What kind of job do you have? A stressful job, but I love it. Okay, it's enjoyable. I want to make some more money. I'm doing good for the world or whatever. People who have one of the C's, which is commitment, seems to handle stress better. They're into it. They, they work, but their work is part of their life. Okay? Their work is part of their life. They live to work instead of work to live. All right? they're, they're there. They have control over their life. They have perceived control over their life. All right? Learn helplessness. This is the opposite. I can, I can quit anytime I want. I'm working hard. I'll just back off if I'm working too, too hard. I have control over my life. Do you ever know that there are some jobs that seem to be what we call burnout jobs? Okay? And part of the big factor in burnout jobs is where you're under a lot of intense pressure. Uh, but what happens, you don't have any control. You know what one is very high burnout profession that some of you are thinking about going into? Nursing, okay, has a high job burnout ratio. One, they don't have a lot of control. They're dealing with sick people, ill people, okay, but they're the low person on the proverbial totem pole that's there. The doctors are telling them what to do. Uh, the, the administrative staff tell them what to do, the patients tell them what to do, and sometimes they have to listen to everybody, but they're in charge of people's lives, okay, in hospital settings, at least. So sometimes they feel like they don't have any control. Another one would be elementary school teachers, okay, because they have too many masters that are there. Uh, people who do, um, what are the aviation people, um, um, who uh, tell you where the planes are gonna land, Controllers, thank you. Air traffic controllers. Okay, they have high stress levels as well, high burnout levels that, that are there. We find people who are hardy, hardy, who when stuff happens to them in their life, they perceive it as a challenge. What can I learn from this? When stuff happens in their life, they say perceive it as a challenge. My wife just left me. I'm not saying she did. I'm saying just somebody, your wife just left you. It's upsetting, I don't like it, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. What can I learn from this situation? How can I like make my life better? Life is a series of challenges. <laughs> oh yeah, right? It's a series of challenges, but you perceive it as it's a challenge. It's not uncontrollable, I have options, I can work it out, I'm down for now, but I'll come back, okay? It's a series of challenges. Are you that way? Most of us aren't. These people are optimistic, things are gonna work out. Hopeful, right, optimistic, hang in there, things are gonna work out. And they have social support. They have people around them who support them. Somebody who says, yeah, things aren't going very good. All right, what can I do for you? Or just let me just talk with you about these things. Just, just I know that I'm not alone going through this. Boy, that's a biggie. Here's an odd statement. People who are married live longer. Isn't that interesting? People who are married live longer. And I'm thinking, even if you're in a bad marriage, and the, re and the answer is yeah. Even if you're in a bad marriage. Why? Because you have perceived social support. Something happens, if my car breaks down, the guy's an idiot, but at least he'll come pick me up. <laughs> That's there. You know, there's, there's the key word, perceived social support. That's there. At least there's somebody. That's there, instead of being by me. No, but does it mean all you single people are going to die early? No, it doesn't mean that, okay? It just means that as long as you have support systems around, somebody else around. I, don't throw things at me for saying this, but I think that women, and, th and this is right, women handle stress better than men do. But one of the reasons they handle stress better is because they have bitch buddies. Okay, so what, uh, what winds up happening is that they're able to talk with somebody. Let me tell you what happened. Ah, ah, ah. And they get things out. Most men don't do that. What's going on at work? Ah, nothing. Well, tell me what happened. What for? And what we wind up doing, we just, we, we hold all that stuff that's there. Again, that engine gets work, work on, right? It's just holding it all in. Rather than when you ask, 
By the way, guys, here's a hint getting your marriages to work. When you, walk, when you say, how was, your, how was your day today? And she says, well, let me tell you about my day. And she's getting it out, and you better learn to do this. <laughs> really? Oh, okay. Wow, oh, wow. Oh. And don't ever offer what? Suggestions. <laughs> have that handle things. You're like, oh, really? Oh, well, that's something. Okay. Now, you can offer solutions and stuff like that and help out. But again, it's women have been socialized to talk and talk and talk and get these things out. And men have not. We hold things in. Hans Selye, I don't think I'm going to have time to do that uh, progressive mental relaxation. I'll do that with you on Tuesday. Okay? Hans Selye said that when we encounter stress, we go through a general adaptation syndrome. His research was groundbreaking because this research shows you, okay, and he did the physiological research to show how stress wears down the body. Now, he did this with rats, and he put these poor rats under stress over and over again, basically watched them die and watched them as their internal systems began to erode and, and develop illnesses and stuff because of too much stress on them. What Selye said is that when we encounter stress, we go through three stages. Alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. I'm going to show you a chart that's going to have these words on here, and then I'll come back and talk about psychoneuroimmunology. That's a big word. Here's the same thing. Here's the... Um, here are the words if you didn't get it. Alarm, resistance, exhaustion, there, that's there. All right? This line here is going to be your immune system and how your immune system handles stress. I mean, this isn't just stuff psychological. This is actually can be measured by T cells and your body's ability to build up as your immune system increases. So in the first stage, called the alarm reaction. When you hit stress, your body goes, whoa, alarm, ding, 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 ding. Autonomic nervous system kicks in the gear, sympathetic part of the, that division kicks in the gear, and you're building up, ready to, to fight this, but boom, your resistance drops real quickly. That's why if you worked real hard this week and you're under a lot of stress, and there's the flu out there, okay, in this stage, you may get sick right away. Boom, right away. Unless your stress builds up and it becomes continuous, and then you hit the resistance stage. Why do you hit the resistance stage? Fight or flight is trying to keep me, what, alive in the hostile environment. And then when your brain says stress, 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 long-term stress, long-term stress, what happens? Your immune system kicks in the gear. And you hear people say this, I don't have time to get sick. I've got too much going on in my life. I don't have time to get sick. So you get the sniffles a little bit, and you don't get sick. Why? Because your body's in the resistance stage. Some of you are not going to get sick from now to the end of the semester because your body's in resistance. And the day you take your last final, you'll come out of it, and you'll hit this stage. And you go, ah, semester's done. <laughs> and you'll get sick. Some of you do this on the weekends. Resist, 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 Friday. All right, let's go party. <sighs> and you're sleeping by 8.30. It's like, what happened? Okay? Because you were exhausted. You crashed. Some people spend days, weeks, months, years in resistance. You spend years in resistance, sooner or later your body's going to give up. This is the analogy of pushing it to the red line. You push it to the red line instead of a, an oil filter or an, or an oil pump going out, okay, your heart may go out. Okay? Or you may have cardiovascular problems, you may have endocrine problems, digestive problems. Whatever the weak link is, spend years here. Boom, exhaustion happens. And that's what happened to Selye's little rats. Stress, 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 stress. After a while, their body couldn't take it anymore, and they came down with major illnesses. Okay? Now, they have major illnesses, okay, but some of them died from those major illnesses. 
Why did one come down with cardiovascular and the other one with uh, uh, type 2 diabetes? Well, it was because of genetic predispositions, whatever the weak links were. As a practicing therapist, okay, I say that now tomorrow I'll say as a former therapist because I'm shutting my practice today and I'm, I'm done, so I'm retiring today. So that's just a quick little thought. So, but as of today, I'll say as a practicing therapist, I'll have people come to me and say, God, I have so much anxiety, I've been depressed. And I say, well, what's, what's happened? Fill me in, what's going on? Well, you wouldn't believe this. I'm doing fine now, but a year ago. Let me tell you what happened to me a year ago. And they tell me all this stuff that happened to them a year ago. A year ago, working, working, or resisting, gotta get through this, gotta get through this. And then, boom, all of a sudden, anxiety attacks, depression, and everything else. And then I try to explain to them, I don't give them lectures, but I try to explain that, well, that's what happens. Your body builds up, you're trying to resist, you're trying to survive, and then you crash. That happens a lot, six months to one year after the last incident, when you think you're doing better, sometimes you crash. Interesting research that's here to show how stress is correlated. I didn't say causes illnesses, it's just correlated, can make it worse. And what is this field of study? There's actually a field of study in psychology called psychoneuroimmunology, a big word, PNI, okay? What are you thinking? What is your perception of the world? Your cognitions that are there? How does that affect the brain? And how does your brain then affect your immune system? So what's going on in your life psychologically? How do you perceive it? Think about it, react to it, exhaustion, and how does it affect your immune system? Psychoneuroimmunology. Okay? Big word that's, that's there. Can I go on? Which of the following do you find happening most often in periods when your life is very stressful? All right, now what I'm going to do from the rest of today to the beginning of next Tuesday is talk with you individually about how you can manage stress. So let's figure out this first one first. Which of the following? Lose sleep, forget to eat, catch colds, become cranky, engage in behaviors such as more smoking or drinking, or more eating. I guess I should put more eating too. Okay. What do you think? Cranky? No, all right. Lose sleep. Okay, uh, and four, become cranky. All right, the cranky was in there somewhere. Bunch of cranky people, all right. So just make you aware, right? Because you need, remember, stress is trying to help you survive. So it's an unconscious reaction. That when you're under stress, you're trying to survive, and sometimes we don't even know we're under stress until it gets to be so overwhelming, and then we have anxiety-based issues. So if we want to learn stress management, we need to get into what's called the stress game. Now I'm going to come back to this. Just let me show you the stress game, and I'll come right back to this. This is the stress game. Go. There's a stimulus. Some issues going on in your life, failures, personal losses, Frightening events, time pressures, insults. You then perceive it, there's the key word, as a stressor. This is the key word. If you perceive what's going on in your life as a stressor, then you get into the game. Then you become stressed. I'm sitting on LBJ, it seems like all the time, not going anywhere, okay? And I'm sitting there. If I'm sitting there going, God, how long is this construction going to go on? About another five years, by the way. Uh, how long is this going to go on? Five more years. Isn't this ridiculous? Did you ever go look at other people uh, who are sitting there next to you? Some of them are like, Argh. I mean, they're letting it. Their perception is, this is horrible. I'm going to be late. What am I going to do? You see some of the people trying to get off. You can't do that anymore because they're doing construction on the side. But they used to go over the grass and out. Now they can't even do that. So they're stuck there, uncontrollable, kind of like Sel Seligman's dogs, right? And we're stuck. Let's hear, I hate this, I hate this. Then you look at some other people and they're kind of like, they listen to the music, they're banging on it. They're kind of like, well, what can you do? It's LBJ. That's life. 
I just have to leave earlier. They're not into the game, but most of us, boom, we get swept away. What happens? Bodily effects, sympathetic reaction, which intensifies upsetting thoughts, which increases in effective behavior, which increases upsetting thoughts, gives you bodily effects, which contributes to increased ineffective behavior, which, right? It's three-pronged, and one does the other one, does the other one, and does the other one. If we're going to learn to reduce stress in our lives, we need to do one of those categories. If you do one of those categories, since it's a closed system, since it's a closed system, if you do one, it'll affect the other two. If you do one, it'll affect the other two. So somehow or another, by the way, I hope you do all three, okay? Somehow or another, you need to learn to, one, manage your bodily reactions. What is stress? It's fight or flight. It's fight or flight. Your body is geared up. You need to do something with this. So if you go home and you go, God, I'm tired. Why don't I go exercise? Yeah, right. I'm exhausted. You're not doing anything with that stress. It's just sitting there. Then you become cranky. You eat more. You eat less. You smoke more. You drink more. Whatever else. Exercise relaxes you. It works off the stress. And if you're doing it to work off stress, you want to do it at the end of your day. Just go work out. Work out all that stuff. So that's there. Anybody work out at the end of the day? Does it reduce your stress? Man, I feel better. Just go like, oh, my shoulders drop. Learn to meditate. What are you going to do when you meditate? You're learning to induce the parasympathetic part of your nervous system. You're shutting down the have tos, the got tos, I must, what do I need to do? And you're just focusing on nothing, letting it all go. I'm going to show you how to do progressive mental relaxation. And this is the time I was going to say, all right, now put down your pencils and paper and I'm going to show you how to do it. But I'll show you how to do this on Tuesday, okay? What, that, what progressive mental relaxation is, we're going to learn to relax each and every part of your body progressively. And I'll show you how to induce the parasympathetic to calm you down. You can also learn to do guided imagery. When I do this progressive mental relaxation, I'm going to ask you to visualize yourself in a very comfortable, relaxed place. See yourself in a comfortable, relaxed place. Your brain does not know the difference between what you're visualizing or what you're thinking about and reality. I think I said that right. If you visualize yourself, maybe on a beach, ah, just laying on a beach, temperature's just right, God, isn't this nice, I'm so relaxed. If you think that, see that, your body goes along with it and actually perceives that that's where you are, relaxation follows. Not, whoop. We'll do that later. Don't answer that. Okay? I have everything timed, and my timing is off today. Modifying ineffective behavior. Remember, there's in the stress game, there's physiological aspects, bodily controls. Now we also have another part of the triangle is modifying ineffective behavior. How do you do this? You might want to just think slow down. Those of you who get out of this class, jump in your cars, race to work, and you go to work like, gotta get there, okay? You don't have to do that. Why don't you just walk out of here, walk as fast, rapidly as you can, but you wanna just think, all right, slow it down. I'll get to that next class. I'll get to work. Why don't have your foot go down on the gas pedal, but the rest of your body just go, ah, I'll get there. <laughs> Take some nice deep breaths. I want you all right now to take one deep breath. Okay? Most of you are breathing incorrectly. Who's taking singing lessons? How do they teach you to, to breathe? In a diaphragm, right there, right? So the correct way of taking a deep breath that is tied in with the parasympathetic part of your nervous system is this. I don't have a big stomach, so it's kind of hard for me to show you this, but when I take a deep breath, my stomach should go out, and when I exhale, my chest should go out. 
Easy way of doing it, little sparrow, is to breathe in through your nose, stomach goes out, and then you want to exhale, your chest goes out through your mouth. Not used to that, are you? You take two or three of those deep breaths. Some of you who are not used to this are going to get a little lightheaded. Because what happens is that you're changing the oxygen, the carbon dioxide levels. If at any time you feel a little tense, think about what I just told you to do. Breathe from your diaphragm. Deep breath. Exhale. Drop your shoulders. Just calm it down. Because what you're telling your brain to do you're telling your brain to slow down. Calm it down. If you have a little test anxiety, when you take your test, the first thing you want to do is walk in there and just take a deep breath. You might want to take your pencil and just look at your pencil. Take a deep breath. Look at your pencil. Just calm yourself down. You look real weird doing that, but... If you find yourself at any time going to go doing this, take a deep breath. By the way, you don't want to take three or four of these because you're going to get lightheaded. Just take one or two. Just calm it down. Can't go to sleep at night? Take some deep breaths. Calm it down. Become one with your bed. <laughs> if you want to modify ineffective behavior, for some of you, what you need to do is just flat out organize yourself. You're so disorganized that you're always running behind all the time. I can't find this, I can't find that. What's going on, where's this, where's that? And you put too much pressure on yourself. What these are called is learning life management skills. Time management, stress management, good decision making, conflict resolution, effective communication. To reduce stress in your life, learning life management skills. You wanna strike a balance in your life between work and play. Go have yourself a good time, okay, and go play. It's a balance that's there. Recognize and accept your limits. How far can you push yourself? How much can I do? I'm doing too much. Back off. Where are your limits? You might also want to write about your feelings. There's some wonderful work about journaling, about how if you journal stuff and write it out, you get the stuff out. What happens to two of us, too much of us, too many of us, okay, is that, I'm talking too quickly, too many of us, is we get these thoughts in our heads and they roll around, roll around, roll around, roll around. The beauty of having a friend of yours to discuss this with is when you get it out, you're freeing yourself from that energy, and then you also get to see what you're thinking out here and realize how, what, irrational it is or how upset it is. That's the beauty of being a therapist that a lot of times all I did was just sit there and go, really? Huh? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And then I'd ask some open-ended question to get somebody to think about things, have them restate, reflect, or I restate, reflect, and then they say, well, what do you think I should do? And I said, you just answered that. Tell me what you just said. And they said, yeah, why didn't I think of that? That would have saved me a lot of money. Yeah, it would have. But. <laughs> But what happens is sometimes we don't do that. Write it down, then you can read about it. The last part, because there are three parts of that triangle, was avoid upsetting thoughts. Avoid upsetting thoughts. Coping statements. I'm going to be able to do this. I can't do this just yet, but in the future I'm going to do this. i got a little test anxiety, but you know what? I'm going to take one small step. I don't think i would be able to conquer it in one easy session. I just want to get better and better just a little bit at a time. You need to be able to take your brain out of words like have to, got to, should, must, I better. When you use those words, automatically your brain says, oh, I guess we better do that, and it induces stress. I have to, got to, should, must, better. You want to replace that. By the way, this is a mind game. You want to replace it with, with I want to. I want to. That's very permissive. I want to. It's a mind game. I've got to, I better, I should, I must study for that test. Because why do you want to study for that test? Because I want to get an A on it. Well, what did you say? 
I want you want to get an A on that. I have to, I should, I must. No, let's go back to I want to get an A. Well, tell me what happens if you don't study. Well, then I'm not going to do well. Well, then I guess you want to study for that test, don't you? I want to work out. I got to, I should, I must. No, I want to. I know this is a game, but it works. Okay, this is part of what's called rational behavior therapy. It's change the way you think, you change the way you feel. Why not think lighten up, because some of you are too tense about things. Why don't you learn to, remember this one? Forgive and appreciate. That was on one of your tests. I said the two key traits of people who are psychologically healthy is they're able to forgive for you. You let go of that anguish, that anger, that everything that you have caught up with that. You let go of that. You're not, for, you're not telling the other person what they're doing is okay. I don't like what you did, but for me, I'm going to forgive. And then you need to learn to appreciate life. Your test is over with. Next test is until three weeks. Oh, yeah, Steve, I got two other tests this week. <laughs> like, no, it's okay. It'll be done. Five more weeks, we'll be done. Appreciate. I mean, the rain is over with. It's supposed to be a beautiful weekend, isn't it? In the 70s and stuff. You see the trees are starting to change a little bit? Ooh, that's pretty. We might have a nice fall. Yeah, isn't this nice? Appreciating yourself, the people around you. Still got five minutes. Don't look at those. What up? All right, I'll, uh, I'm giving away all my secrets. Okay? I'm going to ask you to visualize when we do that one, and then I'm going to show those pictures. And I said, oh, did you see yourself there? Uh, let's go through a couple of questions for you to review for the chapter. Characteristic traits of type A people were what? They include what? Worry accompanied by decreased activity and exercise. Two, a tendency to be mobile, inconsistent, and desirous of change. Poor attention span and loss in memory. A sense of time urgency and chronic anger. Sometimes inflections. All oh, those people. By the way, cardiologists would rather work with type A people or type B people. Who recovers quicker? Type A. Type A people recover quicker. Why? Because you tell them you need to exercise, you need this, and they go, okay, when should I do it? Now, okay. And they work harder. Type B people are like, okay, I'll get to it. So type A recover quicker. All right, everybody get this one? Got this answer? Yeah. Okay. 91% of you. You're just racking up. Oh, at the end of today, by 12 o'clock, I shouldn't say by 12, by the end of today, I'll put your second uh, participation points uh, on there, okay? I'll go back to my office and figure that out for you. Those are these points you're getting for all this in attendance. If you were asked to make up a list of events that were stressful for everyone, you would what? One, include events that involve great fiscal risk. Two, include all kinds of interpersonal interactions. Three, include only events where loss of social approval is possible outcome. Or four, find a task impossible because stress depends on individual perception. This is a thought-provoking question. All right, so key word in this is list of events. Did I talk about anything where there's a list of events? Remember, we're, when we're taking multiple choice questions, we're looking for key words. Those key words should, chapter on memory, cue in information that's attached to those key words. <laughs> All 
Okay, did you get it? All right, come on. We're running out of time here, so. The whistling stopped, so we ran out of time, so submit your answers. Is that your final answer? <laughs> Actually, I should do like Jeopardy, right? I'll give you the answers and you give me the questions. All right, what do we got? Come on, 60% are wrong. Right. Find a task impossible. Why? Because stress depends on individual perceptions. With that list that's there, and I also said, just depends how you perceive this stuff. What could be stressful for one person may not be stressful for someone else. All right, hold on, let me get the... Um,